Britain is no longer perhaps so unique as being the bridge and the transatlantic relationship between the United States and the rest of Europe. This is At Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at the issues behind the news. This week, the U.S. and the U.K., a special relationship. In Washington for his first visit, British Prime Minister David Cameron met with President Obama for talks on the BP oil spill, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the global economic crisis. Observers say the once mighty alliance between Washington and London may be losing some of its luster. Fiona Hill directs the Center on the United States and Europe. She says multiple challenges could stress the special relationship between the two countries. Well, that whole term, the special relationship, uh, everybody uh, dates this back to Winston Churchill, um, although there may have been some other references to this idea of a special relationship before. So it's really going back to uh, the World War II era when we were the great partners and allies in the uh, transatlantic response to um, World War II, Nazi Germany, and to the rollback of uh, the German forces across, uh, across Europe. In many, many respects, that was really the high point of uh, the U.S.-British uh, uh, relationship and uh, being seen shoulder to shoulder in dealing with a, a major uh, problem challenging world security, the transatlantic order, the fate of Europe. Well, is it time for a new special relationship? Observers say that it's time for the United States and the United Kingdom both to look beyond this relationship. Britain may become more subsumed from the uh, U.S. point of view in the European Union overall. Now, we know that Britain is somewhat uh, particularly um, over the last uh, several decades, but also particularly with the personage of uh, David Cameron, always somewhat skeptical of uh, the European Union. But the United States has made a decision for itself over the last uh, several years, and especially since the passage of the Lisbon Treaty, which is creating a new foreign policy perspective uh, for uh, the European Union, that it wants to put more emphasis on its relations with the EU and with Brussels, and really perhaps downplay somewhat the bilateral relationships. Well, Fiona, I think the BP issue goes beyond the deep water horizon spill in the Gulf. BP um, is, of course, uh, in a large part an American company with the absorption of Amoco. And the bulk uh, of uh, the thousands of uh, jobs in British Petroleum here in the United States. It is just as significant on this side of the Atlantic as it is in uh, as in Britain. So British Petroleum is something of a misnomer here. And I think you know really this trade relationship, uh, putting things in a more uh, significant business footing, and also thinking of Britain now as more of a part of Europe, really where we're probably going to have to go with the relationship now. Will there be any policy issues about Afghanistan? There's a lot more pressure inside the UK for uh, the troops uh, to be withdrawn along the kind of timetable that was outlined with the 2011 uh, discussions here in the United States. Of course, on the US side, that was more um, of a target that was given for the decisions to really draw down. We've had a lot of debate, a lot of confusion over what exactly that 2011 uh, date means. Obviously, from the United States' point of view, they would like to keep uh, the British uh, presence and, and support there. They would like to keep the NATO coalition together. And if the UK withdraws, um, or even draws down to uh, such a significant level that there's very um, little uh, UK presence, then obviously effect, that affects the whole image and sustainability of uh, the NATO effort there. What about terrorism and intelligence? The UK is still very important from the intelligence perspective. We still share a lot of information uh, with the UK and the US, and you still have people with dual citizenship like myself, for example, and my predecessor at the National Intelligence Council, where we were the special relationship at work. We were dual US-British nationals working for the US government on intelligence issues, and we were also a bridge uh, to counterparts um, in the United Kingdom. And that relationship remains speci specifically on uh, the counter-terrorism perspective because of the shared interests and some of the same problems that the United States and the United Kingdom have in Pakistan and Afghanistan. How do the G8 and the G20 talks play into the relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom? The age of Britain playing a very significant role in the economic uh, relationships of the G8 and the G20 
is also uh, coming to an end. Britain won't be able to dominate in the way that it has before. And this particular government, the new government with um, Cameron and others, don't have the same uh, base as the last Labour government did with uh, Gordon Brown being very much sort of seen as one of the gurus of, uh, of international finance and the economy having been Chancellor of the Exchequer and having a lot of heavyweights in his uh, entourage on economic uh, and on economic issues. But when we start thinking about the G20, it's really going to be the rising powers or the European Union as a whole. Because if you take the European Union as a collective, it's still one of the the dominant uh, economies. And what lies ahead for the relationship between these two countries? So I think that what they'll be looking for here is to how to put the overall U.S. and British relationship on a, on a, a more business-like, a more pragmatic, and a 21st century footing rather than looking back to the 19th or the 20th or the kind of the great uh, points in uh, history and to really thinking about how a British and U.S. partnership and a, in a larger context, both within Europe and the transatlantic relationship and even more broadly, uh, can really serve the national interests of both countries. Thank you for joining us, Fiona. Thank you so much, Gigi. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Gigi Hinton. We'll see you again next week at Brookings. At Brookings is produced by the Brookings Institution. To learn more about the issues discussed on At Brookings, visit our website at brookings.edu.